IERUK. He's uh, had many talks in Bates and Trinity College before, and we welcome him once again. And he's a very many high profile uh, speaker before, such as Cecil Andrews, which was last year here in the States. Um, and then uh, we have Dr. James White from Alpha and Omega Ministries in Japan in uh, South America, Phoenix, Arizona. He's an accomplished debater, professor, and author of many books such as King James, Only Controversy, and Forgotten Trinity. So we welcome both speakers here tonight. And just to run over the format of the debate today, it will be each speaker will have an opening of 20 minutes, followed by a reply of 10 minutes each. Then there will be a crossfire of 5 minutes, followed by question and answers, which will be 30 minutes long, and there will be a concluding statement from each speaker, which will be 5 minutes long as well. Uh, should I please ask everybody to hold their questions till the end? Uh, and whenever there is a question and answer session, please have the question. Uh, and you know, just a clear, laid out question, nothing too long because we, have, we won't have enough time, we won't give everyone a fair chance. And each speaker will have equal amounts of questions, just to make it fair. Uh, so, to, whenever there's one minute left in the debate, I will bang my hand on the table, something like this, to signify the speakers that there's one minute left. And if any speaker goes over time, the time will be deducted in the end from their uh, following sessions. So, without any further ado, I would like to welcome the Namji first. Thank you. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah. Wassalatu wassalamu ala Rasulillah. All praises are due to God, the God of Abraham, the God of Moses, the God of Jesus, and the God of Muhammad. Peace be upon them all. All of whom worship uh, the same God. All of whom preach the same message. All of whom preach the same faith in different words to different people in different times, in different places. Ladies and gentlemen, I am Abdan Rashid from London, um, and it is a privilege once again to debate um, a reputable scholar such as Dr. James White in Ireland. Today's topic is Did Jesus and Muhammad preach the same faith? This is a very, very interesting topic. Before we actually go into the topic, ladies and gentlemen, we have to determine as to where and when and how the, uh, these prophets actually preached. The Christians and Muslims are unanimous on one point, and that point is that Jesus was definitely a prophet of God. He was definitely a messenger of God. And in fact, the Muslims believe that he is one of the top five messengers of God, including, of course, uh, Moses, Abraham, Noah, and Muhammad, peace be upon them all. And um, we know that Jesus came to the Israelites in the first century, and historically speaking, uh, we cannot simply separate Jesus from his Jewish milieu. Let me explain. Jesus came to the Jews, this much is very clear, even in the Gospels, and he never actively preached to the Gentiles. In fact, in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 15, verse um, 24, we are told that he uh, told his companions, his disciples, that I was not sent to anyone but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So in other words, Jesus is telling his disciples here that I was sent only to the Israelites. Hence, no preaching to the Gentiles or the Romans or the Greeks at the time. So, this was an Israelite prophet, historically speaking, and most historians, they don't actually take the four Gospels very seriously as historical documents. The four Gospels are written for religious audience, audiences, uh, people who believe in Jesus Christ as a messianic figure, some believe to him to be uh, God in flesh, some believe him to be a messenger of God, some actually asserted that he was a prophet of God, and there were diversions and um, distinct views among Christians prevalent at the time uh, uh, at the time of Jesus, not only at his time, of course, in the first century, later, uh, later first century, in the second century, and the third century. So we have Christian groups believing in different things in different places um, um, at different times. So we have a group called the Abunites, who were Jewish Christians, who were Jews, law-observing Jews, who believed in Jesus Christ as a prophet of God, as a messenger of God, and they had two groups within themselves. One group actually believed that he had a virgin birth, 
the other group of Abionites actually didn't believe in the virgin birth. This is confirmed by a third century church father called Origen, that the Abionites were actually split on this very issue. So the Abionites believed in Jesus Christ and they never believed that he was God in flesh. In fact, the Abionites believed that Paul was an apostate from the law of the Jews. In other words, Paul was a liar. He simply cannot be followed, he must be rejected because he came and he simply did away with the law. And as we read the writings of Paul, we clearly see that Paul came and he stated that Jesus died for our sins on the cross. Um, hence, for that reason, law is no longer necessary for Christians to follow. Christians don't have to circumcise and don't have to follow the Jewish dietary laws. So, for this reason, these Abionites, Jewish Christians, Jews who believed in Jesus Christ, rejected Paul. And there were other, of course, Christians who followed uh, James or the Church of Jerusalem, which, were, which was actually against some of the teachings Paul had to share with the Gentile Christian world at the time. So Jesus came and he preached in the first century in a very Jewish milieu, in a very Jewish environment, talking to the Jews, preaching to the Jews. And what faith was he preaching to the Jews? This is the question now. Where do the Christians differ from the Jews? The Christian, Christians differ with the Jews on a major issue known as the doctrine of the Trinity, for example. Or they, of course, differ with the Jews on this issue of atonement by uh, Jesus giving his own life on the cross. And there are many more things we can discuss. So, what was he actually preaching? What was Jesus trying to do in the first century with the Jews? When we actually read his, uh, his views in the four Gospels. Now, how do we determine as to what he preached and what he told his people? The only sources available to us today are the four Gospels about his life. And unfortunately, all other documents were systemically destroyed by the church in the early centuries, especially in the fourth century when the church came to power, the Trinitarian church, uh, laws were issued to suppress all other beliefs and all other writings which the Christians had. And this is clearly stated in Theodosian Code. If you don't believe me, you need to pick up the Theodosian Code when Emperor Theodosius was governing the Roman world and the law was issued and Christians who differed with the established church, the Trinitarian church, were actually heavily, actively pursued and systemically destroyed. This is another topic itself. So how do we know what Jesus actually preached? The Gospels cannot possibly be the, the, the best sources to, to find out what Jesus actually, actually preached because gospels, them, gospels themselves very often actually differ with each other on major details. This again is another topic in itself. But give you a few examples. To give you a few examples. In the Gospels, we have three Gospels, the first three Gospels, the Gospel of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. These three Gospels are known as the Synoptic Gospels. And this is like a triangular um, source material we have. And the Gospel of Mark is thought to be the earliest Gospel among these three Gospels. And the Gospel of Mark took information from uh, some oral tradition which was around at the time and it is thought that Mark actually took what he took from Peter. But this is only an assertion, it's only a claim. I would like James to come and give us solid evidence in this regard to show that Mark definitely took from Peter and we need some testimonies from the first century. Not from the second century, from the first century. No speculations are good enough in this because this is about faith, this is about belief. So in order to establish your faith, uh, you must have solid, robust grounds which are certain, certain realities. No speculations are good enough in this regard. So it is thought that Mark took from Peter and it is also thought by scholars that Luke and Matthew were heavily copying from not only Mark, another source called the Q uh, document uh, or there was a document called uh, Q. It's, it's of course a, a, a hypothesis and it is not certain whether Q ever existed. But the scholars assert that because there is some information which cannot be found in the book of Mark, it must have been copied by Luke and Matthew from another source called Q. Then we have the Johannine tradition, which is entirely different. The Christology, uh, 
or Christology actually goes to a different level, different dimension. Here in the Gospel of John, Jesus is raised from a prophet, from a messiah, from a, from a prophet uh, or a messenger to a divine figure. He becomes a divine figure all of a sudden in the Gospel of John and I am state, statements actually emerge. These I am statements cannot be found in the synoptic tradition. So for some reason, John had to actually set up the Christology uh, about Jesus Christ and his view on Jesus Christ and all of a sudden Jesus turns into a different person. So how do we know what Jesus actually preached? It is very difficult to determine. For that reason, we must go to historians who actually scrutinize every single source about Jesus Christ and take the most authentic information about him. So what do historians come up with? What do they think Jesus actually preached? So we have one such historian known as James D.G. Dunn, for example. He's one of the most prolific uh, authors uh, alive today writing on patristic history, especially uh, the history of Christianity in the first century. And he is of the view that all we can establish about Jesus Christ for certain is that he was a Jewish prophet who preached to the Jews in the first century. Who preached to the Jews in the first century and he was a strict law-abiding Jew and he was a revolutionary character, i.e. he was a Messiah, he claimed to be a Messiah, he was a Messianic figure. That's all we can establish about Jesus Christ. And this is a man who is one of the biggest authorities in the field. Of course, there are other scholars who also believe in the, uh, in, in the same conclusion. People like E.P. Sanders and Gila Burmans, all these people actually uh, assert that all we can establish about Jews uh, or Jesus is that he was a Jewish prophet. So when we actually go to the Gospels and see some snippets of information about Jesus Christ and some of his statements are attributed to him, I as a Muslim, let me clarify very quickly, ladies and gentlemen, we as Muslims believe that the Gospels are not the Word of God. They're not the Word of God. There is Word of God in the Gospels in meaning, not in word. The authors who were writing on behalf of Jesus Christ, such as Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, they were simply writing what they thought was the truth. Now, whether what they were writing was the truth or not is another question altogether, which is another debate. But they were simply writing for their audiences, trying to give their version of Jesus Christ to people they were writing for. So, they were not writing for God, they weren't inspired by God, and if they were inspired and the Christians claimed that they were inspired, I need some evidence in this regard. Who was the first person among the, um, among the Christians or in the Christian history to tell us that these authors were actually inspired? Did they themselves claim that they were inspired? Did Matthew say that I'm writing because God is teaching me or telling me to write? Did Mark say that I'm writing because God is revealing this to me? Did John say that this is from God Almighty? If that is not the case, ladies and gentlemen, then why do we think today that these people were writing on behalf of God? Who told us that? This is the question I pose. And if that, that's not the case, then we must scrutinize this, uh, this information historically and see that a Jewish prophet in the first century, what, what would he actually preach to the Jews? Would he preach something alien to the Jews? which they would never believe in, or would he preach something to them which they would accept wholeheartedly, which some, something that made sense to them, rather than something that didn't make sense to them, such as the Trinity, the doctrine of the Trinity. The doctrine of the Trinity is entirely alien to the Jews. Yet it, was, it wasn't alien to the Greeks and the Romans, because Greeks and Romans could accept man God. They could accept a triad formula. They could accept a Trinity, for example. Because the doctrine of the Trinity in origin, philosophically, philosophically speaking, is Platonic in origin. It is Greek in origin. It is not Jewish. There is no Trinity in the Old Testament. And there are major Christian authorities who have actually acknowledged that fact. Such as William Lane Craig, who is one of the most prolific uh, Christian debaters in the world today. He has clearly acknowledged that the doctrine of the Trinity is non-existent in the Old Testament. Of course, there's another debate now about the New Testament, whether the doctrine of the Trinity actually exists in the, in the New Testament. So what did he actually preach? <coughs> we have to keep the Jewish Jesus in our minds when we are reading about him in the Gospel. Now, I believe in the Gospels there are words which may have come from Jesus Christ. Which may have come. Because these authors, the 
gospel authors were simply picking up information from the oral tradition which was around at the time and they may have picked up some authentic information which came from Jesus Christ. How do we know this? Now when we look at the teachings of Jesus Christ uh, to the Jews, we see that this is exactly what a Jewish prophet would preach to the Jews. And how does that conform to Islam? The question is now, did Muhammad and Jesus actually preach the same religion? No, Muhammad was not a Jewish prophet. He was definitely a prophet of God. There's no doubt about that. And we know that for a fact because he was a man of um, um, uh, a great character. For example, if he was a he could either be one of these three. Either he was a liar or truthful or deluded. Okay, when we look at his history, we know that he cannot be a liar because he was offered all the riches and pomp and glitter of this world. Okay, people came to him, they offered him money, they offered him women, they offered him power, they offered him everything he could imagine to, to achieve if he was a liar. Okay, and he refused. He said, put the sun in my right hand, put the moon in my left, I will never give up this message which is from God. He was not a liar. A liar would never put his life in danger. A liar would never put his family, the family's life uh, in, in, in danger. And his wife died because of an illness he contracted during a boycott which was inflicted against him by the Quraysh's own tribe. His daughters suffered. Two of his daughters were immediately divorced when he preached Islam to his people. And what was his message? People worship one God alone and you will prosper. And this is exactly what Jesus preached. In the Gospel of Mark chapter 12 verse 29 we are told that a Jewish man came to Jesus Christ. And he told him, how much time do you have? Five minutes, thank you. So a Jewish man comes to Jesus Christ. And he asks him, Master, what is the first commandment? What is the first commandment? And Jesus responds by saying, Hear O Israel. Listen carefully, an Israelite prophet, a Jewish prophet talking to the Jews. And who are the Jews, ladies and gentlemen? Jews do not worship a trinity. They are not a trinitarian people. No scholar on the planet will ever claim that the Jews were a trinitarian people. They believed in one God, in one person. One being consisting of one person. And that person was the Father with the capital F. How do we know this? Jesus confirms this in the Gospel. In chapter 8, of the Gospel of John, verse 50 or 54, we are told that Jesus is speaking to a crowd of Jews. And he tells them, I do not glorify myself, it is my Father who glorifies me, of whom you the Jews say that he is your God. Father. Father is the God of the Jews, according to the book of Isaiah again, chapter 63, verse 16. And there are many more passages where Father with capital F is uh, is, is shown to be the God of the Israelites. And that same God talks to the Jews in the book of Isaiah, chapter 44, verse 6, that I am the first, I am the last, and there is no one else beside me. So the Jews don't know any other God except the Father. They don't know the Son, and they don't know the Spirit. This Jewish man comes to Jesus Christ in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 12, verse 29, asking him, what is the first commandment, Jesus? O Master, O Rabbi, what is the first commandment? And he tells him, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God one Lord. Worship or love thy God with all thy mind, with all thy heart, with all thy soul. And what does the Jew say? And the scribe said unto him, Well, Master, thou hast said the truth. For there is one God, and there is none other but he. And then he responds to him by saying, Thou art not far from the kingdom of God. In other words, Jesus actually confirms what the Jew, what that Jew believes in. And remember, that Jew never worshipped the Trinity. He only worshipped the Father. When Jesus tells him that there is only one God, in his mind is only the Father. The Trinity doesn't exist. And Jesus confirms his belief. He doesn't tell him, hold on a second, you Jews. Now you've been worshipping the Father all the way in those previous centuries. Now there's a new covenant. I, the Son, am also a person within the Trinity, and so is the Spirit. So now you need to worship three persons within one being. He didn't say that to the Jew. He told him, Hear of Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And this is exactly, time up. Okay, this is exactly what Prophet Muhammad told his people. Qulu la ilaha illallah wa tuflu. O people, listen and worship one God alone and you will prosper. Then we are told that Jesus tells his people that if you love me, 
then follow me. In the Gospel of John chapter 8 verse 42 we are told, Jesus said unto them, If God were your father, ye would love me. For I proceeded forth and came from God, neither came I of myself. But he sent me. This is exactly what the Quran states that Prophet Muhammad was told to tell his people that if you love God, follow me. I am a prophet of God, I'm a messenger of God. In John, John 14, what we are told to go, again, let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. And this is exactly what Prophet Muhammad taught his people that if you believe in God, then believe in me. Now, follow the law of God. Time is up. Thank you so much. Good evening and welcome. It is truly an honor to be with you here at Trinity College in Dublin and it's an honor to be debating Adnan Rashid on this very, very important topic. I think you have chosen the good thing uh, to be out this evening to ask the question, Jesus and Muhammad, did they preach the same message? Now, the debate tonight will center on whether we will allow the New Testament to define Jesus' teaching or whether we will insist upon placing it in some other context and denying its own internal consistency and harmony, and you've already seen that. Uh, historically, the only way to know what Jesus taught is to look at what was recorded in the first century about Jesus Christ and his teaching, and that is found in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the only sources that exist that came from the first century and that came from the context of uh, Second Temple Judaism in which Jesus lived and preached. The message of Jesus is defined by the consistent testimony of the scriptures that come from the first century and were written by his initial followers, not by later writings of the following centuries. That, I think, is just given by the fact of logic. Now, Jesus confessed in that material that there was one true God. He often quoted the Shema. Shema Yisrael, Yahweh Eloheinu, Yahweh Echad. Hero Israel, Yahweh is our God. Yahweh is one. Jesus taught God's law was good and unabrogated. In fact, he taught anyone who teaches you to not observe this law is the least in the kingdom of heaven. Of course, he also taught that he was the fulfillment of that law. Jesus taught his followers to pray. He taught his followers to give alms, to do good for the poor, to honor their father and their mother. Jesus was a Jewish prophet, and he addressed concerns of Second Temple Judaism. All these things would find parallels in Muhammad's teachings or in the teachings of the Jewish rabbis of Jesus' day. But to limit or even define Jesus' teachings by these things misses the whole point of the Gospels in the New Testament. You see, my friends, there was a reason why Jesus was in conflict with the Jewish leaders from the very start of his ministry. And that's the same reason why the Quran seeks to warn Christians against excess in their deen, in their religion, in Surah 4, 171. Now, one question to keep in mind this evening. What evidence is there that the author of the Quran had any knowledge at all of the content and meaning of the Christian gospel? I've never had a Muslim substantiate the idea that the author of the Quran actually knew what was in the New Testament so as to make any meaningful commentary upon it. Now I understand from the Orthodox Islamic perspective, well, the author of the Quran was Allah himself. Well, all of the historians that uh, Adnan just quoted would never accept that as a given. Not a single one of them. James D.G. Dunn wouldn't. He would say, no, we need to look at the author in the context in which he was writing. And is there any evidence that the author of the Quran even knew what the Gospels said about Jesus? That he even knew that there were Gospels? There's no evidence of that. The only verse cited directly 
from the Bible in the Quran is the Lex Taliobos, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. There's one other possible text from the Psalms, but there are even Muslim scholars that dispute whether that's the case. There is no evidence that the author of the Quran had any direct knowledge of what the New Testament actually teaches so as to respond to it. And so I just simply have to make a, a, a plea. The Quran talks about having equal weights and fair scales. Now, the immediate application of that was in business, do what's right, be fair. But I think we can make a broader application of that, and Muslim writers have. The fact that Muslims should be truthful, they should use equal standards. And I submit to you that the application of naturalistic materialism and that worldview to either the Quran or the New Testament is going to result in a degradation of those texts and in an interpretation of those texts that is completely different than their authors intended. And it's my submission to you that already this evening, Adnan has used scholarship and conclusions he would never allow to be applied to the Quran, but he's applied it to the New Testament. And that is unfair. It is a violation of the Quran itself, which says to argue in a way that is best. Some translations say, a way that is fair. We must use the same standards. And so to a Muslim this evening, I say, you must use the same standards you use to defend the Quran to criticize my New Testament and the Gospels. You must, or you're using different standards. We must avoid anachronism as well. You cannot make the Quran the standard, then look back over history and say, well, if it doesn't fit this. That's reading things backwards. That's not even the, the argument of Surah 5, which we'll get into another time. Now, if Adnan Rashid accepts the words of Jesus recorded in the Quran from 600 years later, without any textual evidence that they go back to Jesus himself, he must accept the words of Jesus in the Gospels from the first century on principle and logic. He must. If he says, well, I accept what the Quran says, but I will not accept what the Gospel of Mark says. So I'll accept something that has no textual history for 600 years, but I'll reject something that was written in the first century. That's not using fair scales, and we need to keep that in mind. Now, what was Jesus' message? Well, let's compare it with that of Muhammad. Really, that's the subject this evening. What was Jesus' message? Let's consider the testimony of the Gospel of Mark. Mark 1.1, 1, 1, we read the Gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Now there's a text variant there. And if you look at the best evidence, there's very strong evidence that that is the great way that it originally read. We can look at the evidence if you want to. I have it all right here on my iPad. We can look at the entirety of it. It's something we Christians do. I've worked in textual criticism for decades now, and we're well aware of these things. But Jesus is described as the Son of God, and it's the gospel of Jesus Christ. In other words, Jesus is the very content of this message. It's not just something that was given to him and then he proclaimed to somebody else. He did that. But it's about him. That's the message. Prophets are given a message about somebody else. Prophets are never the subject of the message. In Mark 1.3, we have a quotation from the Old Testament about making ready the way of Yahweh, and it's being applied to Jesus. Now, very interestingly, uh, Adnan was talking about, well, they never would have understood the doctrine of the Trinity. The funny thing is, the New Testament writers, who all confess there's one true God, took that one name, Yahweh, and they applied it to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, and differentiated between each one. Why did they do that? What were they trying to communicate? They believed the Shema, they weren't denying the Shema, and yet they applied that one name of Yahweh to Father, Son, and to the Holy Spirit. In Mark 1.15, and saying, the time is fulfilled, here's Jesus preaching, the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand, repent and believe in the gospel. What's the gospel again? The gospel of Jesus Christ. He is saying to repent and believe in the gospel, the gospel that is about Jesus. It's about what Jesus is teaching and Jesus is doing. Also in Mark chapter 1, in those days Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John the Jordan. Immediately coming out by the water, he saw the heavens open, the spirit like a dove descending upon him, and a voice came out of the heavens, you are my beloved son, and you I am well pleased. Do Muslims believe that that happened? No, you can't. Jesus is the son. And here you have in the, and this is, the same scholars that Adnan would say this is one of the most primitive elements of the quote-unquote tradition. 
You have the Father speaking from heaven, the Spirit descending a dove, and this, and this person, Jesus, identified as the very Son of God, in whom God is well pleased. And we're only in the Gospel of Mark. Mark chapter 1, verse 23. Just then there was a man in their synagogue with an unclean spirit. He cried out, saying, What business do we have with each other, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. And Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be quiet, and come out of him. Even the demons recognized who Jesus was. They didn't say, you're just a mere prophet. No, they said, you are the Holy One of God. They recognized that he was more than a mere prophet. In Mark 2, 5, when Jesus seeing their faith, he is the men who had lowered a paralytic down to Jesus through the roof, said, son, your sins are forgiven. But some of the scribes were sitting there and reasoning in their hearts, why does this man speak that way? He is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? And that is a proper question. Who can forgive sins but God alone? But Jesus forgave sins. And they weren't against him. And then he healed the man. Forgave him of his sins and healed him. And the people are amazed at the power and the authority that Jesus has. In Jesus, in John Mark 2, 27, Jesus said to them, The Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord, even of the Sabbath. Jesus is the Son of Man. What does Son of Man mean? Son of Man could just mean a human. But that's not all the Son of Man means. In fact, we will see that there is a Son of Man in the book of Daniel, chapter 7, who appears before the Ancient of Days, and he has an everlasting kingdom, and his servants worship him with the highest form of worship. And that's who Jesus is identifying himself to be. And he says he's Lord of the Sabbath. Who established the Sabbath? Yahweh did. Jesus says, I'm Lord of the Sabbath. We're only in Mark chapter 2. We're not even in the Gospel of John, are we? Let's skip along because we don't have much time. Mark chapter 8, verse 34. And he summoned the crowd of his disciples and said to them, If anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the Gospels will save it. Think about that for a moment. Jesus, a mere prophet? Lose your life for my sake. Take up your cross. Doesn't make much sense in light of Surah 417, does it? Except Surah 417 stands against the entirety of history, and there's not a one person that I will quote this evening against the authority of the New Testament that would verify the Quran's denial of crucifixion. Not a one of them. In fact, I can quote the majority of them that would say it's the most established fact of history. Beyond a question. Be happy to debate that subject because history is all mine on that one. Anyways, whoever loses his life for my sake and the Gospels will save it. Life is dependent upon the Gospel of Jesus Christ and following Him. Does that sound like just a mere Jewish prophet? Mark 8, 38, For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of Him when He comes in the glory of His Father with the holy angels. Wow. Wow. This is a mere prophet. Did Muhammad preach this Jesus? Where? Where? I've read all the Quran numerous times. I've read all of Bukhari and halfway through Muslim, I've read parts of the Jamia Termini, and I can guarantee you, Muhammad didn't know this Jesus. Didn't know this Jesus. Didn't preach this message. Mark 9, 2. And Jesus was transfigured before them, and his garments became radiant, exceedingly white, as no longer an earth can whiten them. Elijah appeared to them along with Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. Here's Elijah. He represents the prophets. Moses representing the law. The law and the prophets are speaking with the fulfillment of them, Jesus. On the mountain of transfiguration, then a cloud formed, overshadowing them, and a voice came out of the cloud. This is my beloved son. Listen to him. Not this is my beloved prophet. Jesus is a prophet, but he is much more than that. He is much more than that. Mark 9, 31, for he was teaching his disciples and telling them, The Son of Man is to be delivered to the hands of men, and they will kill him. And when he has been killed, he will rise three days later. More than once, Jesus communicates this truth to his disciples. He says, I must go to Jerusalem. The Son of Man must be betrayed in the hands of men. And he knew exactly what was going to happen. He knew the crucifixion was the very reason why he had come to voluntarily give his life and then to rise again on the third day. We're still in the Gospel of Mark, and Jesus began to say as he taught in the temple, How is it that the scribes say that Christ, the Son of David, David himself said in the Holy Spirit, The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies, I put your enemies beneath your feet. 
David himself calls him Lord, so in what sense is he his son? Here, Jesus identifies, first of all, a quotation from Psalm 110 as being the very words of the Holy Spirit of God. Jesus' view of the Old Testament was it's God breathed and we still know what it was. And we know what the Torah, the Old Testament said in Jesus' day. And here he's quoting from the Psalms. He's quoting from the Psalm about himself. Who is this, my Lord? The Lord said to my Lord. Who is David's Lord? Well, it's Jesus. He has to be greater than David. And he's applying that to himself, and we'll see. That's going to be very, very important in John chapter 4, in Mark chapter 14. Here in chapter 14, a woman anoints Jesus and knows what Jesus says. She had done what she could. She has anointed my body beforehand for the burial. Truly I say to you, wherever the gospel is preached in the whole world, what this woman has done will also be spoken of in memory of her. Jesus knew the gospel was for what? Israel? Yes, but for the whole world. And he knew he was going to die. He knew he was going to be buried. He knew he was going to rise again. And that that gospel would be preached throughout the whole world. So when he's brought before the high priest in John 14, listen to these words. The high priest stood up and came forward and questioned Jesus, saying, Do you not answer? What is it these men are testifying against you? He kept silent and did not answer. Again, the high priest was questioning him and saying, Are you the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of the Blessed One? Jesus said, I am. So much for I am being only in the gospel. John, I am, and you shall see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power. That's Psalm 110 again. And coming with the clouds of heaven. That's Daniel 7. That's the Son of Man figure that has people who worship him. Did Muhammad worship Jesus? No. Jesus has people who worship him. Latruo is the term. Who worship him. Tearing his clothes, the high priest said, What further need do we have of witnesses? You have heard the blasphemy. How does it seem to you? And they all condemned him to be deserve, deserving of death. The Jews knew what he was saying. They understood. Jesus didn't go, Oh, no, 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 guys, you didn't understand. Well, I, I didn't mean that. They knew what he was claiming for himself. And condemned him to death. And here's the text. From Daniel chapter 7. I saw in the night visions, behold, the clouds of heaven became one like a son of man, and he came to the ancient of days, was presented before him, and to him was given dominion and glory and kingdom, and that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve Latruo, the highest form of worship him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. That was the text Jesus applied to himself. That was his teaching, and it was not Muhammad's. It was not Muhammad's. Jesus' message included himself as the king of the kingdom, as the divine son of man, as the unique son of God, whose gospel is the sole means of salvation for all men of all nations for all times. And I substantiated that from simply the gospel of Mark. I didn't even quote from John or Paul. I could have, didn't need to. This is the consistent testimony of the entirety of the New Testament. Muhammad did not preach this message, hence the debate thesis is decided. Because the question is, did Muhammad preach the same message as Jesus? The answer is, no, he did not. And if you want a beautiful example of it, look at this. In Surah, Surah 5, Surah Bamaya, verse 116, Allah says to Jesus, Did you say the people worship me and my mother as gods in derogation of law? Clearly, Shlomo, that whoever wrote Surah 5, 116 did not understand the doctrine of the Trinity. Because that's not what Christians believe. But, there you have it. And Jesus' response also is, If I had said it, you would have known it. You know what is within myself, and I do not know what is within yourself. Those words come from the 7th century. These words, Matthew 11 and 27, come from the 1st century, even by the most liberal dating. And there Jesus said, in the Synoptic Gospels, all things have been handed over to me by my Father. And no one knows the Son except the Father. Nor does anyone know the Father except the Son and anyone to whom the Son wills to reveal Him. Whoever wrote Sir 5116 either didn't know Matthew 11 27, that's my assumption, or rejected it. So here's the question this evening. What evidence do we have that Jesus said, Matthew 11, 27? Well, from a historical perspective, historians will admit that 
We, don't, we, we cannot even begin to know what Jesus said if the Gospels are not a source for us. The author of the Quran told us that the Gospel, the Injil, was given to Jesus. That it had light and guidance. And that we, the people of the Gospel, were to judge what was contained therein. Now that was in the 7th century. How could the people of the Gospel judge by the Gospel if the Gospel had been destroyed in the 7th century? So if it existed in Muhammad's day, we know exactly what the New Testament read in its entirety in that, in that time period. We have entire copies of the New Testament that long predate the days of Muhammad. And so there's our question. The only way for Adnan to win the debate this evening is to deny what the New Testament teaches about Jesus' own words. So what does he give in the place? He quoted John 8.54. One sentence later, Jesus said, Amen, Amen, Lego Humi. Prin Abraham Genestai, Ego I me. Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. And the Jews picked up stones and stones. That was one sentence after what Adnan quoted as being from Jesus. So who's going to be consistent this evening? Who's going to use even scales? Whoever uses even scales will win the debate. That's what you need to be listening to. Thank you very much for your attention. Different sources from different authors. 